Hello and welcome to True London and the final live track of the day. We're here to talk about new cool recruitment tools and practices and I've got a uh, semantic search results of uh, the top experts in the world here today to discuss that with you. Um, so a number of experts, perhaps hand over to Aki first to lead off the conversation. Oh, I became leader. Yes. <laughs> So I'm, I'm Aki and I'm a co-founder of Chopperhead, so we build tools for recruitment industry and try to build tools that would actually make the hiring a bit more efficient because there's a lot of inefficiency in the process. So, so that's my where I come from. And maybe we can continue to do short introduction to all <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm Lisa, I'm Lisa Jones from Barclay Jones and we consult on recruitment technology mainly for agencies. I'm Maybelin, I'm co-founder of Clever Biscuit. We've just built a new recruitment tool um, called Recruitum, uh, which is supposed to help people, uh, introduce people to Boolean search. Uh, I'm Shem McCusker, Intelligent Software. I develop applicant tracking systems, CRM systems for recruitment agencies. I also blog a bit and video a bit and develop a few free tools as well from time to time. Great, and I'm Paul Habgeard and I work for Kelly in our RPO and MSP business. I should probably introduce myself as well, shouldn't yeah. I? Um, I'm Hung. Um, I work in Tech City with a lot of startups that need to grow really quickly. Great. Shane, maybe come to you first in terms of your world, ATS, CRM. Yeah. What's new in your world? Um, well, nothing seems to ever, everything changes and always stays the same. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a continuing problem of having lots and lots of information in the world and trying to extract the value from it uh, in, in different ways. Um, specifically, the, the sort of tracks that have been going on at True. Uh, Martin Lee was doing some stuff about uh, scraping uh, sites, which is always an interesting topic. Uh, I, I've been doing a bit of work on uh, a few little tools to do clever scraping things as well. Um, Maybelline, you've been doing x-ray search stuff, yeah. and, and, uh, and that ties in quite nicely with some of the stuff that Martin was talking about. Um, that's all about getting information. And then, then we're interested in looking at ways you can do some useful with it. Mm. And I guess that's kind of the next, the sourcing and the finding the information is kind of solved in the sense of that it's going to be incremental development. So we make it better and better, but then how do we assess that data? How do we make that to yeah. be not only passive information that we have found, but what we can make made from that online data that is available? I mean, predictive analytics, that kind of thing. or automated assessment, that will be, my view, the next big area that we focus on. That's a big, big bite to take, I think, automated assessment, but is, I agree with the concept that sourcing mm -hmm. is, is kind of a solved problem in the sense that candidate identification is not a problem, is not the all-consuming problem that it has been before in the past. Um, the issue is now um, how do I start a conversation with this person? Because um, I already know who he is and I already know I'm going to hire him. And as Aki mentioned, how do I ensure that this guy is actually what I think he is? How do I ensure he's going to be a high performer um, that I presumed um, from all of this social data that he's put online? And how can I do it quicker than my competitors? Right. Because the candidates aren't loyal as much as they used to be and the client wants things speedier than they used to want mm, them of course. and they don't necessarily want the best candidate anymore they just want a candidate that's going to mm. last 2.6 years or whatever sure but there's, there's, a, there's a gap sort of between maybe their rhetoric on that and you know what they actually believe at the time and, yeah you know you find um the posture of the hiring manager will probably also as a result of some of these things yeah um you know the the, the when i think when aki's talking about predictive analytics part of that is you know, how long would a, a typical person stay within a business based on the profile that we understand of people who previously stayed in that business. Um, you know, as this kind of human capital data becomes more accessible, um, then hiring managers will start developing different habits and different perspectives to the concept of, of recruiting. So. And as well, taking more of the success factors to the hiring process is to take the internal HR data and use that more when you define who you need to hire. Now it's still more, okay, we think that we know who are those that makes best results, but do we really know it? If we look, look the HR data and use more of that as well in recruitment, like, I guess we could make better uh, profiles from the people that we should actually hire. Am I, am I correct in identifying a little bit of a gap 
between this conversation about um, what is potentially possible. I was talking to Bill Fisher earlier on today and uh, Tom Savage about this, this notion that sourcing is no longer a problem. You just go into a computer and it does all these things. And the problem now is all about the, the softer skills of recruitment. My experience of the recruitment industry is the vast majority of them aren't quite at that no. level of the sourcing problem has been solved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But maybe uh, like that's a technical problem. Yeah. It's in a box ready to be used. Yeah. I'm not convinced that the, that the industry understands how to fit it into yeah, their process. Absolutely. Yeah. Or, you're, you're a recruiter. <laughs> well, I'm not a recruiter, but I work with enough recruiters. Um, I think one of the problems is with recruitment, how it is, there's still that turnover of people. It's very rare that you get people who will want to specialize in sourcing. And one of the problems for us, which is why um, we built the tool, was how do you get recruiters up to speed on sourcing quickly if they've not spent the last year trying to But it's to almost told that, that actually sourcing is new recruitment. But the sourcers are actually the new recruiters, and recruiters mm. are like more like account managers. Mm -hmm. there. Mm. Yeah. So it, 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 I, I see it, it going kind of opposite, not from the recruiters to go to sourcing, but sourcing just take a big, bigger chunk of the work. I just pick up on a point you made around um, you know, companies looking for someone who's going to stay 2.6 yeah. six years. So the end result of recruitment should be a high performance hire for, for most organizations. How can they get the best person for that job? Mm. Not always the case. Sometimes you want you know, yeah. someone who will be steady and just do that mm -hmm. job for multiple years. But when you're looking at high performance, you know, there's still very little that I see that attaches performance of a candidate once after they're hired to actually the recruitment process. So mm -hmm. have you experienced anything and any any tools that are starting to, to bring that together? There are no tools out there. Uh, and I'm confident. Anybody watching this <laughs> 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 need two years of configuration you can use those <laughs> SAB and Oracle products for it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason why I'm confident on this is because I've basically tried to find them um, and I've had to build them. Um, because the so the there, there, there are no. So no, you do have the tools. The, but they're two separate things. Is it called Excel? Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 it's, it's all it is. Uh, you, you basically map your assessments against performance. And those two yeah. things have traditionally lived in different boxes, mm. in different parts of the company. Absolutely. So you have HR people doing the performance management and all this kind of career development. Then you get a recruitment function that does all that assessment mm. up front. They, they're separate. Just connected. Mm. Typically separate tools, separate functions. Um, so there is a gap in the market for someone to, to, to stitch those two things together, Excuse me. where basically you understand what the traits of a key performer are, mm -hmm. um, then you map your assessments against those attributes and then you quantify it and measure it as that person progresses through their career within your business. And then you have a, a tool that plugs into all of that gorgeous stuff and goes hunting for people that look Correct. just like that. Well, you, yeah. the, the computer for this is that... just happens. <laughs> it's, it's interesting, I think LinkedIn ultimately wants to try and do this um, mm -hmm. because it wants to create a predictive system whereby you do an auto match based on mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the vacancies. Well look at what's happening with LinkedIn, the LinkedIn University module that they've launched quite softly but actually think about the power of what it's actually designed to do. It's a big data concept where students are the biggest now growth part of LinkedIn and are going to continue to obviously feed the database, the 14 year olds that obviously all flock, flocked onto LinkedIn you know, last week and started registering which is a bit scary, but think about how that's going to affect the average pre-grad if they can track where they're likely to end up as a result of yeah. going to a particular university but also from an agency recruiter's perspective looking at where John Smith is now 47 started up mm -hmm. and therefore from a talent building perspective if they, they get this into their process they can then map back and start building communities in the environs and ge geographies that these people started off in. That's what that should be doing. But again, my problem is the kit exists to do that. It's just the, the, the will doesn't. The practice isn't there, but yeah. the future is never evenly distributed. It's going to be a case where there's, you get some early adopters, you're going to get some companies that mm. demonstrate it, prove the concept, um, and people will copy them. Yeah. I think Google is a great example. Of, of the HR side of it actually, in the sense that they are trying aggressively to eliminate the hiring manager from the recruitment process, because they know the hiring manager is actually a big part of the problem. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, you, um, so you've heard it here first, recruiters actually make the recruitment process more inefficient rather than improving it. Shane, the world would be a better place if human beings did not he recruit human beings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Google, 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 Google doesn't understand this, because um, they're trying to, they understand that basically, 
the hiring manager's agenda is imperfectly aligned with the agenda of the business. He's a human being with a career on, on the line, he's got targets to hit, he's got yada yada yada. Therefore he executes, um, and he's also an imperfect decision maker. So he, a lot of the problems of poor hiring are actually kind of not solvable unless you pull that guy out and go in a different way. So what Google are trying to do is they're trying to use predictive analytics, um, purely data-driven hiring, where they can map, um, oh, look, the best performers look like this, and they started off looking like this. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we should only recruit from these people. If they succeed in these tasks at this level, chances are he's a better hire than mm -hmm. having a hiring manager there. So the hiring manager is involved, yeah. but he doesn't, make ex he doesn't execute the decision. Yeah, but the, to get that actually meaningful data, for example, LinkedIn doesn't have any meaningful data. It's just purely like... Yeah, it's propaganda, uh, individual yeah. programs. Yeah, so <laughs> because you don't have any performance <laughs> data, you don't have that kind of that would, would, that would solve the problem. So LinkedIn is very unlikely to be the player that will... But what about... It might, be, it might be the player because people don't understand it is propaganda. It doesn't matter if it's not true, enough people believe it. Then it becomes Then you've truth. got mass hysteria. Right. Well, <laughs> can, I, can I put another, another <laughs> point to see it? Just, just to play the other side. The recruitment process is so inefficient that if you come up with any of these suggestions, they'll probably work to some extent. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it, it, just changing something is going to give a different result. I mean, everybody knows that. Uh, Interviewing candidates is probably one of the most inefficient things you can do in terms of selecting them. It's been proven time and time again. Psychometrics is much better, but yet most people still rely on the interview as being the selection process. And the gut feel. Mm -hmm. And the gut feel. Yeah, and I mean... And, 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 the, aspect of it. and the first five minutes the of the interview when you've actually made your mind up yes, on whether... and then they decide they don't like the colour of socks you're wearing, and for that reason, yeah. or whatever. I mean, even then... Interviews have been proven that there's no correlation with performance once they're in the job, so it is such an inefficient process, but it's still one of the first things that we do. It's, yeah. a, it's a cultural practice, though, and it's a, yeah. it's a legacy value that we need to aggressively eliminate. Um, I mean, ultimately, if you recognize that this is a problem that doesn't deliver you results, but you persist in doing it, then your business kind of deserves to fail. Um, the interview isn't, sorry to point, the interview though is for the candidate as well, surely? Well, this is one bit too, Lisa. Uh, the, we need to remove the interview as an assessment tool. It's there as a, it's there as a rapport building and relationship building tool to see whether um, you can actually uh, work, work next to this individual, whether there's a cultural match, all that soft kind of business. It's got nothing to do with but assessment. There's also, mm -hmm. there's also an accountability. You're actually putting the emphasis on the high, the, the, the the person that's doing the interview to make the decision because actually that person is probably going to work for them. So there's an accountability piece in corporate life that says, well, okay, ultimately, no matter what I've done as a recruiter, you as the interviewer are responsible mm. for saying yes or no. Straight away. And, and, and that's, that's corporate culture. I mean, Google and has that, a different culture. But <laughs> this is, this is, I can automatically see a problem with that. Um, working in a lot of the, the early uh, sort of corporate businesses I worked in, um, it was very clear that managers were quite fearful of hiring people that were exceptional performers mm -hmm. into their teams mm -hmm. because it would cast them into a bad light. They would much prefer to hire someone who is above average but never going to be a threat. So all this Steve Jobs business where you've got to hire A players, all this kind of palaver, really good if you're a CEO of a business and you, your alignment with the business, your, mm -hmm. your agenda is entirely 100% match. As soon as you start hiring hiring managers, they will drift away in terms of their agenda. Mm -hmm. So this is a cultural problem. And we're about, we're about to solve it. We've seen companies that are moving in that direction. The data that the predictive analytics that Aki's talking about will, will generate this. But the hiring manager is going to go. It's, a, it's, 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 an, it's an obsolete method of building a company. And do you think predictive yeah, analytics yeah. will get smart enough to look at the softer side of recruitment in terms of you know, values, cultural fit, etc.? Because yeah, that again is a really important part of. I think what whoever, we do. whoever whoever are the first set of people to use that are going to be taking a massive risk on their brand. Um, like we always know. I, th I think I there are, there are definitely tools that will will go into the selection process. I mean, we've seen a lot of people talking about video interviewing mm -hmm. in the last number of years, and that's definitely a tool that fits somewhere in the in the interview selection process. Um, and there's lots of others. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the, the problems that technology have gener uh, has, has led to in terms of the plethora of, of choice that is now available to recruiters and the, the ability now to, to go and filter through it all. Um, we started off talking, talking about tools. Oh, I think you've depressed me now with regards to uh, 
there's, there's, there's no matter how clever we are about developing these fantastic, wonderful tools, fundamentally we've got to sell them to recruiters and fundamentally recruiters like interviewing is something that they know is just fundamentally flawed. So are we ever going to develop tools because is there ever going to be a demand within the recruitment industry or the, within the recruitment sector or the HR sector to want tools that will do the job better? The answer is yes to that um, because the recruitment and HR sectors do not speak with the same voice. Okay. Um, they're not a unified group. Um, there's lots of different vested interests in there and some of those interests are not aligned, in fact they're oppositional. Um, so you've got to develop a tool and you've got to understand the market you're selling to and sell it hard to that group. Um, there's going to be a number of different tools that fit that, that process. For example, um, the boys at Rollpoint, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're a social referral program and presumably their audience is going to be HR people as opposed to, uh, I, again, I assume, third party agencies. Um, but another a company that's selling, let's say, sourcing tools, uh, maybe H maybe the recruitment agency market is a better fit for that group of people. Mm -hmm. So the HR recruitment, we've got to be very careful of considering this as a monolithic group of people because there's mm -hmm. lots of different vested interests there. It's an ecosystem. And interestingly, um, sorry, the, but the technology, this could be a big sweeping statement that I might need to retract. Just roll, up, roll with it. Mm -hmm. You, could, you go for it. You set up there and we'll knock it down. Would, 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 it be fair, would it be fair to say that the HR industry tech machine is a reaction to not wanting to use agency. So video interviewing hasn't really taken off in agency for whatever reason. The HR market, as in the corporate market, are using it to uh, deal better with volume recruitment, mm -hmm. recruit, reduce agency costs. Um, there's lots of tech out there for the HR part of the market that is, that is designed primarily to execute and get rid of the agency part of their, their cost and yep. spend. Mm -hmm. So while that continues to be the case, is, is technology going to be innovative or simply just a reaction to cost cutting? Because is it speeding up the process? I'm not convinced it is. What they're doing though is, uh, and we mentioned this in the previous track, but ultimately vendors are diverting budget. Mm. They, they see the opportunities, it's, it's what Chris mentioned in the mm. previous track. It's very difficult to create budget like invent an idea, you know mm. what, Mr. Business, you have to then just you know, create this budget yeah, form. It'd have to be pretty good, wouldn't if, it? Yeah, if it's already it's there, you'd have it. The biggest piece that HR spend is on third-party agency. So the obvious thing for a vendor is try and divert that budget away. Mm. So this is why you see a lot of the tech innovation tends to be disintermediating the agency in some fashion. There's, there's a whole lot of issues touched upon there. The, the, this, this cost thing is because agency recruiters are a profit center, uh, effectively. HR is a cost center, mm -hmm. so you can only sell cost saving benefits to HR. Mm -hmm. You can sell profitability making yeah. tools to, to an agency recruiter. Um, the video stuff hasn't, will never catch on an agency because of the fact fundamentally it's about deselecting candidates mm -hmm. and agencies want their candidates to look good. Video recruitment doesn't do that. Yeah. It just makes them look bad and they yeah. read out the recruitment as a negative process. Um, yeah, just to kind of, maybe we are going to the time that we can actually measure the success of HR and success of recruitment function better and because we have a lot of systems mm. collected data and by doing so we are not anymore only cost for the business and then there is opportunity to move a little bit beyond what the HR currently is that is just cost cutting cost cutting and making real no business value because if you cannot measure something it's so is the, is the future of recruitment technology then improving the recruitment process? Yes. Because at the moment all recruitment technology is doing is layering upon mm -hmm. the existing process more potentially, certainly in the agency market, more distraction potentially, <coughs> um, less quality, more volume. Um, I, the, I, I, I was just going to say, I, th I think there's a really good point there around the way we're developing tech in recruitment on the driver that we're making things more efficient but actually we end up with this tool sitting on top of this tool which yeah. sits on top of this tool which sits yeah. on top of this tool and eventually you get into an ATS somewhere and do a then a bog standard application process so you know there's well, kind of technology like technology has done a fantastic job of making recruitment even more inefficient than it ever was making a very simple process quite complicated oh, yeah, but as well we, we kind of do it by ourselves why don't we get rid of some deck like we don't need ATS for example from my view it's just not needed there yeah. and other things I mean well ATS is a confidence thing though isn't it it's, it's, a, it's a territorial thing it's, it's an asset 
Well, it's a consultant. Yeah, but maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe we could take something, something that would be worse than when I sign my recruitment agency. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good it's to me. <laughs> <laughs> no further reaction. <laughs> I think that the. Look, the, the whole, you, you're exactly right, Lisa, in terms of technology is there to try and improve the recruitment process. And the recruitment process is, is so inefficient, despite everybody's efforts, that you know, putting technology in there, some people will like it. I think the, the, the drive from corporates to go direct is, an, is a reaction more towards old school agency recruiters who were just post and prey mm -hmm. advertising, where, where, where the value of what they did was in the, the big size of their database. Mm. That base doesn't have value anymore because it's not as big as LinkedIn. So the agency market is reinventing itself to be more of a, a proper s value add in terms of extracting value, mm -hmm. in terms of providing the right candidate rather than 1,500 wrong mm -hmm. candidates. Um, that's, that's what we have seen and, and no doubt will continue to see. So there's always a role for the agency market as long as recruitment is diff difficult. And recruitment seems to be getting more difficult. So for that reason, I would say there's even more demand for agency recruiters. Mm. Good agency mm. recruiters. Good agency recruiters are actually able to deliver. Yeah. And I, th I think as well, when you look at what a talent strategy will have to look like for an organisation and truly start to think global, yeah. how many organisations truly recruit globally in a serious way at the moment and look for talent globally? Very, very few. You know, but actually, the agency model can do that mm. and can provide that for you. So, you know, will the next generation perhaps be how can we better do global talent searching? Well, there's and there's two products that do that. Am I allowed to talk about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's global global recruitment channels, and the other one's totally gone out of my head. I'm really sorry, whoever built that one. But the idea is, as an international recruiter, I can tap into the systems to to, to gain insight on why somebody in China is likely to move, what job boards they're likely to look at. So if I'm a global recruiter based based in Ipswich, I can tap into this data and see you know, what's going to happen in China if I land that vacancy and, and what, not language literally, but what, what I need to do to fulfill on that without actually travelling all the way out there. Cause, mm. you know, so it makes post and pray more efficient, but it's not <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't change the process, it just gives more information to do more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we should have had, Graham Reed was here earlier on from Antel and talking about China and, and, and then they have spread everywhere, mm. every remote little place in the world, mm. there's an Antel office opening up. Mm. Uh, and yeah, what they're doing is trying to keep everything local. Yeah, within building local within, communities. Within a wholly owned and a franchise network. Yeah. There we, go. we touched on social referrals earlier. Um, I think uh, I've heard so much over the last three years of social referrals and how it's going to completely change our world, etc. Doesn't seem to have ever quite happened. Is there, are there things happening now that's going to mean that 2014 is the year of social referrals, like 2011, well, 2012, and 2013. <laughs> I think again, it's the, the, we've got this really disconnected, almost like an app store of recruitment and 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 HR related products, and I just think the market is really immature in terms of we still expect everything for, for nothing. We're not prepared, you know, you ask a recruiter to pay for LinkedIn and they get haughty, <laughs> but you take LinkedIn off of them because they're not prepared to pay for it and they'll admit how much money they're going to lose. Mm. And I think until the market, as from an agency, I can talk mainly about agency and tech matures, we start accepting that speedier processes and better lead generation will cost us money, good investment, then we're not going to really capitalise on this stuff because we're not actually going to take it seriously. I and mean, therefore we're not going to use it. You, know, you use things that you pay for, don't you? The more expensive stuff you have, you use it better. But I think as well, like all, all the lovely social referral apps, I remember seeing at HR Tech last year, blew my mind from a process perspective, but it's just another bit of kit that doesn't quite fit into the big octopus that's now got 400 legs rather than eight. If the social referral tools were built into the ATSs and CRMs and plugged onto the website and all the social media platforms, that's when I'd get really excited because it would just be like breathing. But at the moment, it's something you have to do outside of the process to make it work. But well, I think that's maybe one problem. But this, again, from the recruiter perspective, how we can get the data to flow. But again, if the pipeline doesn't really work, people are not referring, there will not be any social referrals. And I, I think that's the topic that we touched a bit yesterday, that you have to have a company culture that people actually want to make a referral. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have any tool, will not solve it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's the problem well, for most of the companies. They're trying to develop the tools, aren't they, to avoid 
the, the, the person that's doing the referring actually have to do any referring. The whole point is they don't need to have an action. Well, they can't have everything because it's they can't not use agencies and they can't not have referrals and have a piece of kit that just brings magically people into the office. The referral piece for me is another agency disabler, isn't it? Because it's almost like that's another thing, another string to my bow to prevent me from using agencies. But again, it's, it just doesn't seem to be taking off as well as it could do. Well, I think agencies could be using the same techniques anyway, mm. and, and do. Mm. Um, but they keep them very secret. You go to the average agency website, do you see anything about referrals? Yeah, agencies mm. fundamentally have a problem with referrals. Um, simply because of how you structure a recruitment agency is that every man is his desk. Um, so you literally, you've, mm. you've actually got a company with several companies in there. They're just operating under a single umbrella, uh, umbrella brand and they have to share an office. And fundamentally, the, the interests of one agent uh, compared to the second agent were comp competition. I've got no interest in helping Aki. He sure as hell has got no wow. uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, That depends on the agency. You're right that that's the typical model, but it's the, there, are, there are lots of agencies out there who break from that mold and start yeah. interesting do things as a result. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so, so we need to see a profit sharing recruitment agency with collaborative um, tools. With Collaborate, and then all these tools will work. But right now, the predominant model, uh, and I'm happy to make the generalisation, simply because I, I'm prepared to say 90% plus of recruitment agents do work in this way, where it's a single man, um, is his desk, you're responsible for your number, and you've got to deliver against that. You know what? If you don't, you're out the door. So you've got this type of model. It's inevitable that this is going to be um, kind of fairly hostile um, to, it's a very hostile environment to sell any services into because these guys are all salespeople and they're all sort of looking after their own number and all looking after number one. It's very, very difficult to sell into recruiters, I'm sure at least you'd agree, you know. Or maybe you, maybe not Lisa, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you've got an uh, agency so that's eating from, from an Well, I don't work, we don't from work for everyone, but the ones we work for really like us, so that's great. But from an in-house recruiter perspective, you know, theoretically those social referral tools are, you know, one of those silver bullets, you know, starting to you'd actually open up those networks. You'd, you'd want to try Allegedly, yeah. they are always a better hire. Yeah. Um, you're getting, I don't know, 40% of your recruitment from 7% of the people mm. applying. You know, you're suddenly turning an efficiency argument mm. into a really strong tool. So how does it look from the RPO perspective? Do you like... Absolutely, yeah. We, we would utilise that as a, a tool to develop those networks internally and to use internal referral programs to, to boost the referral as a, as a source of candidates. So it's almost like a foundation yeah. you build everything else will follow. And the re return on that investment mm. would be much, much higher than us having a more traditional attraction strategy. But how easy it is, I mean, techni technically it's no dif difficulties, I mean, it's just... Culture, there's nothing culture's the hard part. Yeah, how do, how do yeah. you get those then work, those programs that you... Yeah, and it takes leadership from the business to, to work with the heads of that business to say this is the cultural change we're going on we need to adopt this mm. to actually make it happen and therefore you need to be involved and that's a very hard conversation for a lot of customers and they'll come to so, so really the, so the stumbling block then is, is is a process on a cultural problem rather than a technical problem I think so. the, the tools have been around for forever yeah <laughs> a whiteboard and a pen mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, i mean Sorry, how, what how, was that how, how, how difficult can it be yeah. to share information yeah. but yeah. but there's a there's a fundamental problem with people don't like talking to other people uh it's not something uh, in in the sense of that form of collaboration yeah LinkedIn, have they relaunched the referral engine? I'm not sure where they've got to with it. I think they have planned. I don't, I don't think they have. Because there was massive noise yeah. about how it would work. And then at one point, it just got yeah. absolutely. It was, it was always going to be the next big thing. It never yeah. was the big yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Um, the other piece which I wanted to catch up on, perhaps uh, again looking at ATS and CRMs, is uh, the amount of data that ends up sitting in them. Yeah and the fact that you end up with can't see in the woods for the trees half yeah. the time. Yeah. So what's the, the next generation of search? What's the next generation mm. of being able to actually harness that data in, in CRMs mm. and ATSs? Well, it's the LinkedIn recruiter model, isn't it? Well, unfortunately. No, I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't I'm not saying unfortunately. Well, that's one of the options, isn't it? It's, it's to, to get that integration piece in. Because that, that's the nirvana, isn't it? That but I still have my assets as a, as a business manager, mm. but I can tap into the bigger data set out there and it, it's lovely if it talks to each other. That's, that's but the, that's but, but LinkedIn don't solve the problem that you've addressed of seeing the wood for the trees. All they do is bring more trees, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, so there's a bigger forest out there. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the, 
the look at something well I'll blow my own trumpet, it's something that the intelligence software has been working on for the last ten years, is is all about trying to spot the one opportunity to find the one candidate you're looking for right now. And if it's if it's about giving visibility, it's about tidying your desk, it's about being able to see the the, the little golden nugget there. And you know, from a from a tool's point of view, my favorite tool, my favorite website, uh, is Google. You know, I mean from from an ease of use point of view, you cannot get simpler than ease of use for Google. Mm -hmm. Don't think how complicated it is underneath. Yeah. It's able to go and look at this vast array of information pool, just the piece of information that you want right now. Point and two, so, exactly. if you could adopt the same uh, same approach in a in a cleverer way, so that I don't have to ask the question of my system; it just gives me the results because it knows what I'm looking for at that moment in time. And there's lots of simple things you can do. Um, and, and I spend my time dreaming up little tools and techniques to be able to do smarter stuff with it. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's it's all about just trying to put your put your your screw your head on as a recruiter and say, right, what what would a really clever recruiter do right now? And develop a tool that will do, do you know it. I think what we what recruitment is just not tapping into at the moment is the, is the dual screen so we you know I, I think I joined, I joined recruitment in 2000 the company that I was IT manager for had no IT which is why they brought me in and we went from zero PCs to 150 in like three months and everything went a bit lo loopy for a while and then they made loads of money because they got really quick and their competitors had nothing fantastic Still faxing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so I, I still remember that day and that time and what everyone was wearing and how fabulous we all were. And now I look at the fact we've gone from no screens to two screens. And what I'm talking about here is I have my laptop and I have my device. And the average agency is not capitalising on that. And the apps that are only available on that and how they could be used for recruitment. And the, and the, and the way that that could be used outside the office to capitalise mm -hmm. on the fact that the, the talent isn't maybe interested and certainly very passive from nine to five, but slightly less passive beyond five o'clock. And I think the future for agency recruitment is capitalizing on um, the time when a candidate is least passive, not necessarily active, using devices that are totally mobile, which I know is like a probably really obvious thing to say, but they've all got the equipment, they've all got it now, they're just not using it. They've not injected their smart device into their business process. A lot of recruiters can't find the paper CV that's sitting on their desk buried underneath a cup of coffee that's gathering a bit of blue mold. So, yeah. I'm not going to be drawn on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do see it, I see, I see it every day. I see recruiters only using their smart devices to tune into Facebook because it's been blocked. I'm thinking, well, what, how can we engage with this, this bit of kit? Because it's there, it's integrated. Are they probably getting more use from that? than that from a, from a life perspective a phone now is just simply an app on the computer in their pocket that's what it's turned into and i want to see the recruitment industry tapping into that smart device more effectively and not just using it as something to do when i'm having a fag if that makes sense but actually engaging I'll get my soapbox now. yeah it's an interesting challenge for the in-house recruiter with the uh, corporate structure of what you're allowed to do socially as well and how mm -hmm. to break down those barriers to actually use social as a, as a proper tool. Mm. And from a CRM perspective, I totally agree that it should be more like a connection point. It should not be only data management. It should actually be as thin as possible and then you just connect it to the online data. And then you just analyze it heavily. I mean, three billion profiles that you can find from Google now. It's quite much talent. How do you find the right one? How you can automate the process? That's, that's going to be a big, big thing and that should be part of the CRM process eventually. It will not be first there, it will be built for other companies and then it will acquire to be one CRM source. The, the only thing you're missing there, Aki, though, is, is that the only purpose of the CRM really is to make notes on it. Um, so, so well, if traditionally. It's to ring fence, it's, 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 it's to protect legalities and terms and invoicing. Sure, that I all understand. But on Aki's vision here, where the, the web is either CRM, is more or less what you're saying, which is all fine, um, but you still need something to track your process. Um, that's still a manual input. Mm -hmm. um, now that's why I think we have this existing need for people still buying software. And CRM software, ETS software, that's expensive stuff. But the team can contain the communication layer there. I mm. mean, it, it's not going to be only. I mean, and there is, as well, agencies will have the value on understanding what kind of relationship they have with their candidate and should be able to tra track it. I mean, that's for sure. But if you if you try to pull that 3 billion profiles to your own database, yeah, it, will not, it will not work out. 
I'm sorry to say we've got to wrap it up there. I'd like thank to you. thank all the panellists for, for joining us today at True London. And that's our last track session. So thank you for tuning in. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next True event. Thank you.